what does a beautiful future look like to you? You can flip a negative mood on its head. This was a talk that was all over the place, but then New York, you are all over the place. There are experiences that you just don't get anywhere else. I'm the Raps Jenny Maz, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 92nd Street Y talk event for Fox's Prodigal Son, featuring a conversation with stars Michael Sheen, Catherine Zeta-Jones, Tom Payne, and executive producers Chris Fedick and Sam Splatter. Thank you so much for joining me today, guys. Pleasure. Good to be here. Happy to be uh, here. So Prodigal Son centers on Malcolm Wright, uh, Bright, played by Tom Payne, and his notorious serial killer father, Martin Whitley, aka The Surgeon, played by Michael Jean. Uh, as Bright works as a criminal profiler for the NYPD, and his father lives out his life sentence for murdering 23 people. Uh, and for the recently ended season two, because we are now talking with a wrap season two here, uh, Catherine Zeta-Jones joined the cast in the recurring role of the mysterious Dr. Vivian Capshaw, who gets dangerously close to Martin as Claremont Psychiatric's resident MD, which ends up being more of a danger for Martin and his son than Vivian, as we find out uh, at the end of the season. So I want to start at the end of the season because we finally can talk about that. Um, for you, Chris and Sam, by asking, uh, this was still filmed during the pandemic, but at a very different time than you guys were last year when you had to wrap season one during the pandemic when it was just starting and I know that episode got affected a little bit in terms of what you had to move up and how you had to change things a bit. How can you compare that to the experience of plotting out the back half of this season because it really flows and goes all together in a way um, where if there were any kind of changes you had to make due to the pandemic or if it's really the finale you guys set out to have as your finale this time with no changes in between. I'll go first. Uh, I, I was just gonna say, we got to tell the exact story that we wanted to tell, which was so exciting. But truthfully, because of the pandemic, we had to keep thinking in our minds, well, what if we can only make 10 episodes? Well, what if we can only make 11 episodes? Like we never really understood, you know, we just didn't, we can't see the future. So in planning for that, what Chris and I found ourselves doing was at the end of 10, we wanted it to feel like it could be a season finale. And then at the end of 11, we wanted it to feel like it could be a season finale. And then it, and then by the time we felt like we could go the whole way, we got to do 12 and 13, this like epic sort of, you know, we think of it more as a film. So the, the pandemic only scared us creatively enough that I think we, we kept pushing ourselves to get to the point, you know, uh, because we didn't know when we were going to have to end. Mm -hmm. after, after we wrapped last season, I think that we had, you know, there was a certain point where we were doing maybe two hours of COVID meetings every day. So we were properly scared, you know, by the point we started the production is like, we had a great process and we had a good, you know, there was a great plan kind of going forward, but it, you know, there was always that chance that we would have a problem. We'd have to shut down and we also had to make moves throughout the season. So, you know, yeah, we had to, we had to kind of think on our feet and which is kind of like, you know, it's like a part of television is always like you're writing, but you're also writing in front of everybody. So it's just like, we're coming up with ideas. We're making moves as we go. So like Sam said, we got to tell, the exact story we wanted to tell, but we had we had moves if we you know couldn't have done that. Uh, so for you, Tom, uh, Michael, and Catherine, I wanted to get your opinion on going through what they just described perfectly as it feels like for like the final four weeks of the season, every episode is a finale. Which kudos to you guys because it kept them going that way. Um, but what it was like for you three playing out like a finale every single week until we get to the true end, which is a serious. <laughs> I think it's been really fun that we've been building up to this prison break idea. Um, and then we actually did it. Like I, you know, it's one of those things that like, well, they can't actually break him out because when they break him out, what are they gonna do? And where's he gonna go? And, and the audience, but the audience really wanted to happen as well. And I love the fact that we end episode 12 with us on a speedboat heading out into the middle distance. Um, and I, I saw a little bit of that the other day and it just made me go, how is this not the finale like how is this not the end like what is what happens in the final episode 
and then the final episode is suitably bonkers and 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 martin is out in the world with his son and it's it's a whole other experience of the show and what i've always enjoyed about the show is that the characters are so strong and that you can put them in any situation and it's interesting um but then we put some really strong themes and and situations um, behind that and we really end up in some fun places so it, it's been uh, obviously a wild season and there has been certain amounts of ducking and weaving uh, and dodging going on but um but we've definitely kept this strong thread through um which has a huge payoff at the end of the season which um is really exciting and fun and i think the audience are going to get a big kick out of it i mean i think every episode should be a finale <laughs> of, of, of the entire series i don't think you should ever write an episode that you don't think could be the finale. If you're not doing that, you're not doing your job. You're right, you're um, and, right. and also I would say what was lovely for me anyway, personally, was that it felt like I got to do like that Catherine and I got to do a finale together in a way, mm -hmm. because I don't see, oh, no, I can't say that. I don't see, uh, we don't see each other in the final episode. So it was nice that after that whole journey between us that we got our kind of finale and then Tom and I got a finale together as well. Because you know it would feel I'd feel I'd feel a bit cheated if I hadn't got both, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, from from those relationships because they've been the primary relationships for me, you know, throughout the whole season. So that felt nice. I like that. We, you know, coming in as the, as the new the new kid at school, um, each of the episodes that the guys wrote with me involved. I, I mentally wanted to like seal it up so that for, on the next episode I had, you know, I had all these different ways in which this character to go. I mean, I personally had one through thread and, and, you know, the guys pitched me a really crazy, wacky um, character. And so I had it all inside. And so each time that the new script dropped, I had this whole little package to be able to just tweak all these crate, all this stuff that was like boiling under the surface. And that was actually, it was a really interesting exercise for me as an actor, because unlike Tom and Michael who had season one and you get into a rhythm and a pace with your writers and the way it's shot and all that stuff. Um, I came into the, to it and it was also kind of, that's, that's a fire department. It's not my house burning down there. This, um, <laughs> Um, you know, I, I came into it and I had to play, you know, a little bit of a catch up and it was really fun. It kept me on my toes. It was, didn't know which way it was going, but each episode had its own little, it was its own little bubble, you know, you know, apropos to what you're saying that each one could have been a, a season finale because when I read episode, you know, the second season episode 12, I went like Tom said wow where is this gonna go you know it, it was just a classic on the sunsets and off they go into the distance you know um but they came up and to claire and to claire so um it was like, you know it's, it's a lot of fun it, it's um it's kind of like it's like it's a bit like doing live tv in a way for me it was like it, it had that kind of i don't know energy and pace to the whole experience on Prodigal Son. Uh, so in season two, uh, the other difference I noticed between um, two and one is that one, we really had the mystery of the girl in the box uh, driving Malcolm and Malcolm's relationship with his father and, and the overall mystery. That was our like whole arc tying in many other things throughout the season. Season two, I found it interesting that you guys kind of broken in half where at first Malcolm is very concerned about Ainsley and Endicott and then when you guys come back from break that gets wrapped up and he has no idea about what's going on with his dad and Capshaw um, at Claremont until it's too late and then he has to kind of come into this whole mystery that he didn't even know was going on and start to work this case what was the decision behind that it's kind of like an A B um, plot that I really enjoyed and, and why you divided that way uh, and why you waited to bring Malcolm back into this because he's been away from his father long enough that he doesn't know enough about this and he has to pick it up uh, to find out toward the end. A lot of it has to do with Catherine. It's like as we were kind of building the season, you know, we get to a point where like we knew at episode eight we wanted to bring in, you know, Alan Cummings character of um, Simon Hoxley and that would be our way to wrap up the the first half part of the season with Endicott and that mystery. But also once we cast, once Catherine was interested in the show when we pitched her and she joined us, it's just like, she's so fantastic. And, and there was such chemistry between Michael and her 
that we found ourselves just like, well, we have to write more to this. You know, we knew we were building to this. We knew this was going to be where we were heading. But, you know, this season, one of the things about COVID is that like, you couldn't do like a wedding party. Like we could do things in season one where we'd have explosions and flying out windows and landing on cars and giant, giant kind of like summer blockbuster type stuff. And this season was just like, this was gonna be about our characters and it was gonna be about, you know, real scene scenes. And it was gonna be about twists and turns. And like, I think that emotional twists and turns. And we just found that like that kind of like excitement, we just wanted to write more to it and write more of those scenes. And, and with Malcolm, you never want your, your lead behind the eight ball for too long. And so as he, as the escape begins to happen, now we're kind of, now he's got to catch up. Now he's got to figure out what's going on and his life is torn up about it. And so I thought, we thought that no one plays anguish like Tom Payne. I don't know what it is, but he plays, you know, it's like, you know, the, the trauma that he captures and it's like, it's just, it's just, you can't, you can't, this would put him in a terrible place. And for, in, in a weird way, that's what we do on this show. And so it was, you know, it, it's it all kind of folds into those things. So there's casting and there's story and all that, but um, those are the, that was our, those are our big ideas. Am I supposed to talk? Oh. Yeah, Sam. <laughs> you You're don't. Supposed to dis <laughs> Sam's, Sam's supposed, to supposed to dis disagree with me. I don't know. Uh, yeah, no, Chris, Chris said it great and I forgot what the question was. So. <laughs> I talk for, I talk for so long, nobody cares. Uh, Tom, let's go to you being anguished, uh, which is, is it, uh, a big thing in, in the final scene between you um, and, and Michael here when uh, it looks like Martin, who has reverted back to his old uh, surgeon ways due to the situation uh, he was just put in with the woodsman and what that brought out in him, is going to kill his son and then Bright has to, for the second time in the series, stab his father, but in a very different way than it was done in season one. And I wanted to get your uh, take on that moment because we've seen something like that for in a very different way where that was like a father and son like kind of planned it out in their mind. And this is actually turned on each other and, and what that actually means for where they are in their relationship at this point that was already a very <laughs> volatile relationship, unstable to begin with. Yeah, I mean, that that whole last episode is very interesting from the point of view of their relationship, because at the beginning, it's like that same thing of like him trying to rein him in, and keep control of him and, and keep him in a box. But actually, he's out in the world and he's going to try and do what he wants to do. And then that, I mean, this, the scene between Michael and I, where I ask him to torture the woodsman is... Um, it's, our show goes to these really screwy places, which are so <laughs> crazy and extreme. And But because of the grounding and because of the wonderful actors that we have on the show, we can really go there and, and ground it and, and make it real. And um, so we can go to that place where I am now seemingly the bad person for pushing him to kill someone else again. So we've flipped that whole dynamic on its head. Um, and then I'm... <laughs> It, it, we're just really messing with the audience because then I what we found out the boys told me from screening the pilot way back when is that people didn't like it when uh, <laughs> that when other characters were mean to Michael's character which is completely bizarre but um, absolutely the truth that this murdering person has managed to engender the um, the affection of the audience so much that they don't like it when people are mean to them so for someone to stab him is a whole other thing and if it was another character that stabbed him then that would be a huge deal. And that character weirdly would be disliked. But for, to make it me that stabs him at the end adds this whole other layer to the whole thing. And, and in a way, looking at it, I, I, when, when that whole idea came up and that last scene, it's kind of the only thing that can happen with that relationship is that one of them tries to kill the other one at some point. It's really the only resolution that, that I can see, but it's not planned out. Um, Michael could talk to maybe how far in advance uh, that Martin had made that decision, but but Malcolm hadn't made that decision, I don't think, until that very moment. And I don't think he means necessarily to kill him, but it's a fight or flight moment. And then I think you you can see what it means to Malcolm written on his face at the end of the season. Um, but that relationship is so intense that it, one of them needs to be released. And there's one kind of ultimate release, you know, and I think if one of them passes away or the other one passes away, I'm not saying that's what happens, but if, you know, who knows 
where that relationship can go. But I think ultimately, peace will only be found when one of those people doesn't exist anymore. Uh, Michael, uh, because it, it really looked like at the beginning of that episode, Martin was trying to make a go of like, let's be father and son on the run. We'll be a team solving crimes in secret. Um, don't turn me in uh, kind of thing. And, and what he really seemed to have wanted to try to make work, but we also know it's always so much deeper uh, than that with what Martin thinks he wants, what he actually wants, who he's trying to manipulate. So what did you see there? throughout mm. the episode and the shift that we get to that brings us to that final scene there. Mm. Well, I think that it that final scene in a way answers some questions that have been there from the very beginning of this story about, you know, what what is Martin capable of feeling or not feeling? What is the truth about what he really wants from the relationship with Malcolm? Um uh, uh, but in other ways it 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 brings up more questions as well. So I think in the in the moment of playing it, <clears throat> excuse me, I've always sort of felt that Martin has an agenda. He has a conscious agenda. He has an unconscious agenda. So his conscious agenda is one thing, and then his actual agenda, maybe or, or a, a, a sort of a deeper agenda, is there, regardless of whether he's aware of it or not. And then there's window dressing. So there's stuff that he says is going on and that he feels and that he plays with. I mean, he's in prison for most of it. He's not going anywhere, so he can just play with people. Do you know what I mean? And some of that play is fun play and some of it is serious play. And some of it, he's aware that he's playing and sometimes he's not aware that he's playing. So the question of, you know, he's been saying that he wants to uh, break out and escape for Malcolm, that it's about his family. And yet in the moment when that freedom is jeopardized by Malcolm, he just goes, mm -hmm. I kill you, I kill you. That's that's just in the moment, that's what happens. So there's him as a as a human being, and then there's him as a, a, a hunting animal. And when his back's against the wall, in the moment, he'll do anything to, to, to survive. I think that's, and that doesn't necessarily contradict the fact that he also wants to have a relationship. He, he can he can in the moment go to kill his son and at the same time want a very deep, meaningful relationship with his son as well. I don't see a contradiction in that when it comes to Martin. Also, I like the fact that we're just writing Bible fan fiction now. That <laughs> Abraham and Jacob, the son actually turns on Abraham and tries to kill him in that story. I love that. I think that's great. <laughs> it's such a better version of the Bible too. Yeah. Exactly. Well, Michael, you have to be well, careful. Because plagiarism. Didn't it plagiarism. <laughs> oh, sorry, Kat. I said plagiarism. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great book to steal from, though, I'd say, you know. <laughs> Catherine, before these two try to kill each other, you try to kill both of them uh, and get very close on um, both of them. And I want to talk about Capshaw's evolution from this woman we meet in the infirmary who we're wondering, and it's one of the first things Martin starts to wonder about, which is why are you working here? What is a person like you doing here? You're so smart, you're so ambitious, why here? And now we know why, and it's a terrifying reason why, but it's so compelling. So I, I wanted to get your take on that slow burn of the kind of person Vivian has to be to invest the time to do that and the obsession she has to have with the surgeon, with the Martin to, to go to these lengths that we see her at. And also syringe roulette is really creepy. Yeah. Um, it's just um, I think that, um, you know, when the guys pitched me this, this arc, um, which was so, cause I'd seen the show before, um, to work with, you know, Michael, who's from my hometown was like um, in the bucket list. And so I had seen the show and, 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 um, and so I was interested to see what this character was going to be a doctor in that the bowels of this, you know, psychiatric facility. Um, and my question before I, you know, I read, you know, any of the scripts that were to follow them from the first kind of script I saw was what is she, why is she here? And, um, and so the, my backstory was like endless. So, you know, there was with this, with the, with the, the focal point being the surgeon. Um, she knew the surgeon and um, 
was this woman scorned? Was this woman taught by him? Was she in an operating room with him? Was she infatuated him, hated him? You know, all these different things were, were bubbling, but I think the fundamental was my, my, my kind of the, the grassroots of this character is that she's a sociopath, just like Martin Whitley, in that she's able to cajole, please be whoever you want to be on the outside, but inside there's a very deep troubled woman and that was probably the connection to on when he was on the outside world being the surgeon he she he would have been revered within her you know medical um community and there was uh, there was the, that's where the beginning of this fixation was and when he turned and when he was when he murdered these 23 people it wasn't a shock it, it, it intrigued her because she had that same gene of being suppressed and um the great work that michael has done with this character that Tom was just was just talking about was that to play a character of such badness and make an audience fall in love and want to protect is it's 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 in the writing and it's in the portrayal you know and it's it's a very fine line of 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 it's it's I, I, I worry about Michael's mind it is a sociopathic mind too it's that luring you know I think historically some of the great big great big names of serial killers if you think of Ted Bundy you look at them and they're you get why a woman would go in a car with that guy. You know, it, it, there's something about these crazy, sad, deep, troubled, dangerous people that you know is attractive. That that that, that they they have that ability um, to be able to lure people in, and she has that. Um, yeah. When she gets. There's a, my reasoning was why, how does she end up here? My, you know, Martin Whitley asks her that. And it's because of him. She wanted to be in his world again, you know? And, um, and then in, I think it's episode, I think it's episode um, 12 that when I do have my two boys, you know, I have my family complete right now. I have the son, I have him all together in my tortured world. And, you know, Martin asked me, what do I want? And I said, I want that. I want what he has. I want all of you, you know? And so what was fun for me was, um, you know, that suppression, you know, that making, putting this character into a pressure cooker. And waiting then for the guys to drop the scripts and knowing when to release the lid a little bit, you know, and then having that fun episode in, uh, you know, episode 12, but that it just lets rip, you know, I, I, all my, my wildest dreams and fantasies and the sickness and the, you know, the, the control and the, the, the sycophantic behavior of this woman comes out within an episode. You know, and um, and then one thought I said to myself, OK, what happened now? You know, <laughs> you know, it's like once the credits roll on episode 12, I'm screwed. I got nowhere else to go. I'm depleted. And then the guys write something that has a, a great twist so I can, you know, delve into that family, the Whitley family, which is the structure of this show. I think this what why our audience as crazy as it can get. Um, the characters with the great performances, the Tom, Michael, and you know, all the cast, is that they're rooted. They're rooted in something. So then they can then they can bounce around and and do some crazy stuff. So it was it was great. So I got to kind of in, in the last episode, just make my leave my my fingerprints on some of the Whitley family. I'm not finished yet, you know. Um, but it was it was it was it was so much fun and and having that having that um, little bit of a magic ticket a like carte blanche to be able to be a little dangerous be a little you know risque maybe you know try some stuff you know that 
And this character just gave me that opportunity. It was a lot of fun. Uh, for Chris and Sam crafting that because last season we had the like um, mental threat of Endicott that, that we knew that that was someone Martin was scared of and that was them. but we have never seen until now Martin in a victim situation in a literal like victim situation like this and what the point of, of crafting this and giving us this experience and the chance for for Malcolm to see his father that way and to allow Vivian to drug him so that he could go try and save his father and let them have this bonding, especially in this episode before what we get to in the finale finale. Yeah, Chris, I think is, Chris is always pushing us to be the sexiest thriller possible. <laughs> While we're also trying to be the, the silliest comedy and the darkest uh, serial killer drama, but in the sexy thriller of it all, we were like, what if a woman comes into Claremont and it's like, everything that we were able to play out. It's just fun because, you know, the while we're recording this while we're still on the air. So my barometer for the show is just my wife. And watching episode eight, where Catherine kisses Michael at the end, uh, my wife gasped and hit me with two hands. <laughs> no! What are you doing? Vivian Capshaw, oh my God, you can't kiss him. You can't be with him. And like Catherine's saying, I'm kind of just like smiling in my mind, like, ha, 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 you have no idea what's about that. <laughs> and that's just what we wanted to build. And that's exactly what we built because that's that's where we are right now. For an episode eight, Capshaw's in trouble. And then in four episodes, Martin's in trouble. And we wanted to, that, that just was super exciting to us. I don't, um, and so, it, and so, you know, like most good ideas, we just throw it out there. Like, like we, we have the kernel of a thing. We want this thing to happen. And then somehow with our writers and, and between ourselves, we, we figure out a way to make it work. I don't know how we make it work, but like, that's what we knew. When we wanted to bring in a cap shot, and especially when we heard it could be Catherine, it's like, we got to tell a good story. And this, this one made us happy. We do go from crazy to crazy. I think that we, we've talked to a number of different writers over the years. They're like, oh, you want to come work with us? So Sam and I, we will come up with a crazy idea. And, we, and then some writers will go like, oh, oh no. Oh no, I can't, no, I can't work that way. You know, it's like, but, but we, then we go back and we figure out, well, how would the drama work? How would the characters fit? And how would we make this all kind of come together? So it's like, that's the fun of it. And I think that with Michael and Catherine and, and, and this, in this story specific, it was a spider and the fly. And like the, the question really is who's the spider and who's the fly? And, and just speaking to like, you know, what we do with the show is that we're always twisting around loyalties and folding it into a, a family drama. And just going back to like the testing scores that Tom brought up, it's, it's really crazy when you're watching the show with an, a test audience and it's that weird experience where you're seeing the numbers. And the moment you have like a father-son scene, the numbers go through the roof. And you see, it's like they love, they love Martin Whitley and you're like, He's a serial killer, but it doesn't, you know, but that family dynamic that like, you know, romance and all those things that, you know, that we, we want the show to be as well as a, a procedural with a mystery. That's what, that's, that's the thing that Sam and I are so excited by. And we're so excited that that's the show we're getting to make because there was a lot of times along the way where it's just like, oh yeah, there's, you know, there's another version of the show, which is the straight procedural. And that was not what we wanted to do. And, you know, this cast is what allows us to do it. Uh, Tom, while all of this is happening, uh, that he's trying to sort out where his father is and what's going on with his father, and then he's abducted but slash saved by his father uh, so they can get away from Capsha. Um, before that, he shares his first real life kiss, not head, uh, kiss with Danny, and, and that's such an exciting moment until he's taken away, and we don't, we don't know what's going to happen to him, and she doesn't know what's happened to him, and then we find out she's sees what happens and what he's done and, and what's occurred between him and his father in the finale there. So, well, I was really excited for those two and, and where that's going to go from here. How do you think, first of all, very glad to get to that point and what your feelings are for actually having reached that in real life, because uh, we got there in the alternate world, but then how that will be affected by where Malcolm currently finds himself in that exact moment and what comes after that. It's, it's kind of funny because in making the show, like I watched, watched episode nine last night uh, when it was on, and um, there's, a, there's a moment in that with um, Danny at the house and then he ends up shuffling her out with, as um, his father appears to him in another uh, daydream uh, in the scene. Um, that in playing it and then also in watching it, like there's so much going on in Malcolm's life 
that that's another part of it that he's not he's barely holding on to like every aspect of his life but that's just another part that is like somewhere within him he knows he wants um some kind of relationship with someone that is not his family um and that he can fall into and gain comfort from and but i think having personally having experience of that and seeing other people have experience of that it's not a very healthy way to start a relationship or be in a relationship and um so i think it's 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 so crazy because I think I'm I'm happy for him in that moment and happy for him in that scene and stuff but it's not anything that can be given the the right amount of focus and depth that a, that a relationship would require because it's just everything is so insane so in a way like you you see it and you go oh that's really nice but oh my god this is it, it's it can't really ever be given the um care and attention that it that it needs or that he needs as much as he would want it. And so it's a kind of, in that episode and in that scene, it's it's like an act of desperation. Um, and then of course he gets whisked away and ends up in a torture chamber with, um, <laughs> with Vivian and, as you uh, do. and his father, as you do. So he never really has any kind of time to sit in his feelings um, because his feelings are always involved with everyone else's around him. Um, so he's never really centered. Um, so as much as he would, even if he sat down and had like a proper think about, okay, so how do I feel about this person? And do I want a relationship with this person? There's so many other things in the way. Um, but I think this, this definitely could happen in the future. But then as far as the season ends, um, I don't know how that's going to affect everything. I guess we'll find out. <laughs> uh, before I make Chris and Sam not answer me on what happens next, I'm going to ask uh, <laughs> Michael to tell me um, how it feels like that could possibly go on if if um, Martin survives and he's okay and everything, how he could possibly find a way to face Malcolm and have the same relationship and go back to normal, which wasn't normal to begin with. Like, how do you go back to Claremont? Would they even let him go back to Claremont after all of that happening? What would be the next step if Martin survives? Would, have you thought of that yet? What, what that could possibly be for him? How do you recalibrate? How do you come back from that? Well, one of the really useful things about Martin is that he just can. Just go, <laughs> I'm just going to ignore that. That's, that's, that's over there. Like in the scene where um, I, we, I've sort of been able to do it a couple of times through the, 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 the whole story so far. But in the scene uh, between Martin and Malcolm after the group therapy session, when they've sort of teamed up, partnered up to try and solve this uh, murder at Claremont. And they come back to the to Martin's cell, and and Martin kind of like feels provoked and lets rip at Malcolm and says, you know, about I would I would hate you if if all of these things were true. And you sort of see potentially what is really going on for Martin, and then it's gone. He's just like <laughs> it's just not there anymore. And he's like, but I'm that's not who I am. And <laughs> that ability to just completely uh ignore or or to have a blind spot or whatever it might be i think is is very fundamental to who martin is and why martin can um like i said before about having there's a conscious agenda and there's an unconscious agenda and he is very divided you know as a man he's he's got a very divided psyche i think and um uh which is why he can think of himself as a wonderful father and also then attempt to kill his son. Like those two things don't contradict themselves for him because he very conveniently is able to just compartmentalize things. So in a sense, I don't think it would be a problem at all for Martin <laughs> to be able to, um, I mean, there was another moment where after I had, you know, gouged the guy's eyes out uh, <laughs> as like a, like as a dog do. bringing in a, a dead bird for, you know, Malcolm. Uh, <laughs> And then all the police and everyone comes in and pulls me off his body. And then I sit down on the bed. And what I sort of tried to do there as well was just to go, that didn't happen. It just, you know, I have no memory of it. And I'm psychologically not in that place at all where I just was. I'm now in a place of like, oh, hello, Danny. How lovely to see you. And, you know, and that kind of stuff. So I think he has that ability all the time. And I, so in a way, and that's kind of useful, I think, for the character and for the writing of the character, because you can sort of go anywhere <laughs> with it and and also then allow 
him to be kind of hijacked by what is really going on. Because like you say, that would be impossible to recalibrate. That would be impossible for an, a normal person to do. And it and it's it should be just as impossible for a part of him to do, but another part of him finds it incredibly easy. So you've immediately got a conflict because you can, an interesting dramatic conflict, because you can have Martin just carry on like normal, but then he can be hijacked by that part of himself that he's not connected to, you know, as well. So that's, and that's interesting, isn't it? As an actor, you're like, oh, that's great. I love that kind of thing. That's brilliant. Uh, so yeah. that's a Welsh thing though, because in my family, <laughs> in my family, as opposed to like my, the Douglas side of my family, in my family, it's like, oh, shut up. You yeah. know, something about, it, it, it's something very like, no one takes it and then the next minute we're on each other's laps kissing, I love you. It's like we, we, we kind of explode. Yeah. Real, real, real argument. And then it's done, man. We're moving on now. That's, that's gone. You know, that's what's something I relate to very much. And Michael's going, is everything all right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he just pissed me off. <laughs> you know, with my brothers, it's like, oh, you know, anyway, I was brought up at that. And so I've, I've kind of introduced that to my own personal family. It's like, you know, anyway, maybe it's not a Welsh thing, but uh, yeah, <laughs> I remember seeing that. It's like, I was, I'm able to kind of go, okay, done yeah. that, done that. Okay, on to the next, leave that go. <laughs> maybe I'm a sociopath. <laughs> Chris and Sam, uh, I'm going to ask you guys, uh, I know we haven't been renewed for season three yet, but do you guys know what your opening scene is there for coming right back in? What your plans are for bringing us back into this situation? Because last time you gave us a jump and then we kind of came back and saw the filled in pieces of, of Martin and uh, Malcolm in the season one finale there. And also, if we will be having Catherine join us again, because we know how that kind of wrapped up for her, but I don't want it to be the last of Capshaw. I'm going to visit Capshaw in prison. Oh. You work for Fox? Are you a Fox? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll let Chris handle that one. I don't know. <laughs> We would, I mean, nothing would make me happier than the Catherine to come back and, you know, find more story to do as, as like Sam and I have said, you know, we love to come up with these kind of big, crazy notions. And sometimes they're one episode and sometimes they're, you know, arcs that we can run through the entire season. It would be, a, it would be, you know, we would, we would be thrilled. So, uh, you know, I'm not going to tell you what our ideas are right now, but we have them and they're crazy and they're fun and they're very much in keeping with what we like to do. And I think that, I mean, the, I mean, the one thing we probably would do differently is we might not do a, a jump. Like we did a jump in season two because we were gonna have a whole bunch of things that were happening in between, including COVID. So we wanted to like, you know, create a, a zone, you know, but I think maybe in season three, we would maybe come in a little bit quicker and so we have a lot of things that we want to do kind of in a very compressed period of time so you know, read into that what you may i know it doesn't sound like a really good you know you know but we, we we're, we're talking now and we're so excited with the um, uh, season three shapes that we're working on yeah we we always try and think of our finale as something of our the the launch of our next season as it were so really the penultimate episode episode 12 was a finale like everyone's saying, it's about, and then 13 is just going to prove to you that the show can keep going and it keeps having legs. And I think one of the big reasons for that, like Michael was saying, is that whatever Martin's next move is, it both makes sense and you don't see it coming necessarily. And, and, and Michael, I was just thinking with, I'm just remembering back to a great moment on set like two weeks ago where Michael just had a line and every time it would come out differently. And it was the one time he got Tom to crack, actually, because it was just like, and I talked to him, I was like, I had no idea what you were going to say the next take. And he was like, I didn't really either. And I think that's what Martin is. So that, that gives us this freedom in the next season to, to keep telling our story that we're telling in 13. And, but it can go to all these great places that, that are crazy and make sense at the same time. And I, I think we've discovered that Martin uh, really loves to, to, to play other characters. Mm. Just putting a leather jacket on. Mm. Like, I love this. And now I'm Claire and I'm a, ma a mountain man. Like that <laughs> opens up all kinds of possibilities, doesn't it? <laughs> and it makes me laugh. <laughs> uh, yeah. We're just trying to entertain Michael here. Let's be honest. Exactly. <laughs> 
Well, thank you guys so much for joining me today. Uh, thank you all for attending the 92nd Streetwide Talks event. We hope you've enjoyed this conversation as much as we have. So thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you very much.